Hello, my name is Russ Algar. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry at UBC. My research group studies luminescent materials. These are materials that emit light or glow. We study these materials to better understand them, their properties, their chemistries, and how we can utilize these materials for applications. And in particular, one of the things that we like to do with these materials is try to light up molecules that are relevant to health and disease. Things like proteins, genes, or even molecules that indicate certain types of cells. We want to try and find ways to detect, identify, and count these molecules or cells so that we can use them to improve healthcare from the standpoint of diagnosing disease and monitoring treatments for disease. One of the main projects or themes in my research group is the idea of taking what would be called molecular diagnostics, so things like blood tests that would normally be done in a big fancy lab using sophisticated equipment with really highly trained people, and moving that to a portable low-cost platform that would be like a smartphone-based device, so that those types of tests could be done anytime, anywhere, whether that's a big city, a rural or remote or northern community, or someplace out in the field where we're responding to a health crisis or some other situation. So as an example, there's a very sophisticated type of instrument called a flow cytometer, which is a really fancy sort of hundred thousand to million dollar instrument that gets cells to line up single file and then measure them one at a time to see what molecules are on their surface. And that information can help tell you what type of cell they are and how they're contributing to health or disease. Well, that's a very sophisticated, hard to access instrument that only exists at really specialized cost intensive units in big cities. What we want to do is make that a technology that is small and portable so that you could go see a doctor or a nurse in your community and they could just do that type of flow cytometry testing right then and there. In the Algari group, we uh, develop tools, materials, technology to support uh, healthcare becoming more accessible and inclusive. So for my research program, one of the main themes is trying to make technology more accessible in terms of healthcare, particularly diagnostic healthcare, which means that we are seeking to serve communities that are outside of big cities like Vancouver. And so students come to UBC, for example, from all across the country, from all across different countries around the world, and they bring different perspectives for what the limitations are where they live. And within our research program, what they can come in and do is say, you know, I'm from here, I have this experience, we have this difficulty. And they can start to take that perspective to our research and then start to make tools that will then solve that problem back home for them. And I think that's a really cool aspect of some of what we do. So when thinking about what my team members do in the research lab, it's a few different things. So if you walk into the lab, you're gonna see people wearing lab coats and safety glasses sometimes, and they're gonna be doing experiments, trying to make different materials with certain properties. They might be trying to build devices or prototypes that have certain functions. So this is another thing that we do in the Algari group. So this, uh, this will actually allow you to measure spectroscopic properties of your material instead of taking images. So you will be getting cast. So this is also part of our research where we actually build things. We align optics and build things. They might just be talking with one another, trying to solve problems. Or they might be talking with me, also trying to solve problems. We might visit five or six different labs or facilities around the department or around the university, accessing different tools to do the job. And so there's a lot of day-to-day -day variety. When I think of examples of specific equipment, we have like the glassware with the flasks and the test tubes like you'd see in Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. 
But we also have microscopes, we have laser spectrometers, we have 3D printers, we have computer systems running simulations. When we have visitors come to our lab, we, we show them everything, but I think one of the big things we like to show them is our single molecule fluorescence microscope. And so this is in a really fancy lab that has climate control and dust control. It looks like a microscope, but it has all this cool optics and laser stuff going into it. And the power of the single molecule fluorescence microscopy, it allows you to actually see the behavior of each individual particle or molecule that you're actually measuring. What you're seeing here is the behavior of individual quantum dots. And as you can see, each quantum dot is actually exhibiting a blinking behavior, which means it's turning on and off over time. And so we can actually show people a piece of equipment that can quite literally see and count individual molecules. When we're doing things like trying to make low-cost devices for real remote areas, we have to have design rules about how much do things cost. We can't make a portable device that is just as expensive as the laboratory device. And so part of the strategizing for planning that research and development is to think about the cost of individual items and how we can replace you know, really niche specific scientific hardware with stuff that you might find off the shelf at like a hardware store or a grocery store or something like that. And so this improvising comes in quite a bit when we do research. Uh, duct tape is surprisingly popular. <laughs> at a typical day, I think it's not very glamorous, but there's a lot of cleaning and preparing work involved. And the actual experiment, the thing that is all hyped up in undergraduate labs, doesn't really happen until you've planned for at least a day on what to do. To remember that a, a day in the library saves you a week in the lab. We don't need to go out reinventing the wheel because a lot of what we do has already been done before and we're just reapplying that knowledge in a new, uh, new way. When I was a student, especially before university, Science was this thing we learned to try and better understand the world around us. And that's not a bad thing, but it really treats science more as a noun than a verb. It was missing the action of science. Real research is what an actor would call you know, off book. You know, they say they're on book when they're reading from the script, and that's what an undergrad research lab is like. When you're a researcher, you don't have a script at all. You are writing the script as you go. And so you really have to bring that creativity and problem solving to the table in planning and different strategies and you know, backup plans and everything else that you don't really have to face in the undergrad lab. Most of the time your result is, is not what you expected, but you can see is there a failure? No, did not. So there are no failure in our scientist dictionary. Most of these failures actually open a new avenue for the new research ideas. Experiments or the projects that you learn the most from are the ones that they don't work. There is an element of mystery. We don't know what's happening or why it's happening, and we're the ones that get to play the role of a detective and try to figure it out. And yes, it can be frustrating a lot of the time. It is frustrating. But once you've kind of pieced together the puzzle, it's like a murder mystery, and you've figured everything out, there is a bit of satisfaction in being the first one to figure that thing out. Most of our ethics is concerned with, are we doing rigorous science, where the focus is on making sure that we're tackling important problems and we're doing our best to be as correct as we can in finding the answers to the questions we're asking within that scope. If we can get different types of independent measurements, whether using different techniques or things that are conceptually different, that all point to the same conclusion, we start to feel more confident that we have what we call you know, a true result. And then we also have to make sure that what we're doing fits within the framework that the scientific literature provides us. 
That's not to say that everything has to align with what other people have concluded before. In fact, it can be a good thing when some things don't align. But if your piece of the puzzle doesn't fit with anyone else's pieces, it's probably indicating that you have something that's wrong. For me, I think one of the really cool things that happened in my career was someone wrote this review article, which is basically like a summary of the state of the art in my field. And they had this timeline of really important studies. And on the beginning of that timeline, there were a bunch of papers by authors who I looked up to as some of my scientific heroes. And then partway through the timeline, my own paper showed up, which was this really nice affirmation and sort of pat on my back to say, wow, people are paying attention to what I'm doing and I'm helping move science forward. Mm -hmm.